Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. So I want to welcome everyone today to the Wired to Lead podcast. We are going to jump in right away. We've got a great guest. It's Stephanie Millward uh, calling in um, from or checking in with us from the UK. Um, Stephanie is a Paralympic gold medalist uh, in swimming. Her preferred, um, and Stephanie, you'll correct me, you jump in here, but your preferred strokes are um, you've, you've had enormous success in the 100 meters, um, 100 meter backstroke. Is that your preferred? Uh, did I get that right? Yeah, 100 backstroke is my favorite event. My world record is five seconds faster than anybody else at the moment. Excellent. <laughs> All right, well, we're going we're gonna to be talking about that. Well, the context of why we're here, again, is the, uh, and welcome again, Stephanie, is, is that we talk about, we're, the discussion today is around cognitive preferences, specifically around the cognitive peak profile assessment. Um, the, the CPP, as we call it, is available um, uh, from the Avalon Institute website, www.avalonleadership.com. Uh, you can join Avalon. You can take the assessment that we'll be discussing today. Um, the specifics around our discussion today are around thinking, being, and doing. Um, we're going to find out some of the keys. Uh, uh, Stephanie's already taken the assessment. Um, to her success and how these particular preferences, how her brain uh, reacts and makes meaning to different types of information come into play. Um, We'll also be talking about uh, her performance and resilience as well. Uh, Before we jump into the scoring on on this, um, I do want to introduce everyone else who's on the podcast. Uh, And once again, uh, Stephanie, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Uh, There is a big uh, five-hour time gap, and I know we're, we're cutting a little bit into your training, but I um, want to introduce our uh, Avalon teammate and, uh, and managing director, Ms. Sharon Roberts. Uh, Sharon is an uh, entrepreneur, a business coach, uh, entertainment coach, uh, works with a, ride, a wide array of clients uh, over in the UK. And Sharon, we want to, want to welcome you here today. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for the invite. Really looking forward to it. It's going to be really exciting and looking forward to the day. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, and, and of course, as always, we have, uh, I'm, I'm working uh, right to left here. Uh, we do have uh, Cameron Gott. Uh, Cameron is our co-host on the Wired to Lead podcast. Uh, Cameron is, uh, is a, a leadership coach, uh, ADHD coach, uh, and also Avalon teammate. Cam, I'm going to give you a second here, but I do want to introduce Aaron Mattias as well, our Avalon teammate. Uh, uh, Aaron is our millennial teammate, uh, keeping us balanced uh, in everything that we discuss. Uh, Aaron is also um, uh, works at Lehigh University uh, as a uh, in, as the Leadership Development Office uh, Associate uh, Director. Uh, she is a, 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 the former Associate Swim Coach at Lehigh, and so she's going to be uh, helping us out with some of the, the guidance around uh, Stephanie swimming and keeping us on board. But uh, let me shift it over to you, Cam, for a second, and, and uh, give us a little perspective on what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Thanks, Perry. And uh, Stephanie, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, what we do here in the Wired to Lead podcast is, is really dig into uh, what resonates with you, uh, what makes you tick as a uh, leader, um, as a uh, competitor, right? I'm really interested in uh, where do you find the uh, drive, right, to, to, to get in the pool day after day. Um, we were recently talking with Kiko Matthews and, and uh, talking to her about training. So having several people on the call about uh, former athletes to dig into um, your drive, uh, your resilience, and uh, overcoming challenge. And we look at that through this lens of uh, what we call the cognitive peak profile. So you've taken it. We'll share the scores. And um, as you talk and just share your stories, we ask you questions. We're going to point out what might be. Uh, your cognitive traits or preferences at work. 
And we're going to ask you if it resonates with you or not. So just to say, yeah, that resonates or no, it doesn't. And uh, we can dig in there. So it's really looking at leadership. It's looking at um, uh, being competitive uh, through the lens of uh, cognition. That's what I've got, Perry. Well, let's break it down for anyone who hasn't joined us before. Uh, we've had a number of these broadcasts. We do. We, we actually just released a primer, um, and we put it up on our YouTube channel, the uh, Avalon Leadership YouTube channel. So you can go to that, uh, take a look at the slides, and, and it will break down a little bit more of the language that we're talking about. We're going to be starting here with Stephanie, and we're talking about the three, uh, the overall cognitive processing modes. Uh, sequential processing, associative processing, and dual processing. Now, Stephanie, you came up as a dual processor. Uh, a dual processor um, is a little bit more rare from what we've seen um, in, uh, in, in our work with uh, athletes and leaders. Um, what it means is that you have balanced access to the dot connecting uh, a, a portion or network of your brain. You know, in other words, the why, why am I here, the context, and then you shift over very readily into the sequential processing. So Aaron is a dual processor. I am a dual processor. Cam and Sharon are more associative. They are, let's say, faster processors, so to speak. So for them, uh, context, uh, starting with the main idea, um, is, is really where their brains prefer to activate. And they, it's not as if they're deficient and can't get over to the systems uh, side of that, but for them, it's a little bit more um, uh, primed in, in the associative side. So you are a dual processor. Uh, your score showed up as uh, 53 to 47. We had a little bit of time. I'm going to let you talk, and I'll stop talking, but we had a little bit of time before the broadcast. And if you'll tell us a little bit about how you, you mentioned your training regimen. And so you, you tend to shift pretty – it resonated with you. You tend to shift over from the why to the how to the how to the why, right? Is that, does that work for you? Yeah, definitely. With everything I do, I always can jump between people. Like anybody who's talking, I can jump to anybody, and I can um, I can think about uh, what I'm doing, where I am, and where I'm going next. Yeah, I can change change my thought process all the time. It's easy to say. I see Cam making notes here. Um, well, you got uh, so when you say jump to anybody, you know, again, so so what I do is I pay attention to people's language and it just rolls off the tongue for you. I jump to anybody. Um, what does that mean? Like what, tell me when you say you jump to anybody, tell me what, what is that in what context? Well, if anybody enters the room, you can talk to absolutely anybody. Some people yeah. are very quiet. Some people are very loud. Some people are outspoken. Uh, you can just speak to anybody and you can almost, uh, almost mirror them. If, if they're upset, if they're down, you can, cheer them up you can you can almost read read anybody you're ready to to be open for anybody does that make sense <laughs> yeah <laughs> it does the um the dual processor is often a a leader role who can sort of needs to talk to everybody right in an organization to be able to talk to the people in accounting and then or the it people it might be more sequential preference and also talk to the folks over in um you know marketing or uh, you know, in the, in the, in the art division or the, the creatives, right. That might be more high associative. So making that connection and it resonates. Aaron, Aaron, uh, jump in. What is it? How does that resonate with you? I think it was, uh, immediately the word that you said, Stephanie, um, mirroring them. Um, I've definitely found as a, a coach and I'm also, as Perry mentioned, a, a balanced processor, but I, I find that, I, and I talk about it a lot as being able to mirror whatever athlete that I'm speaking to or student athlete or person. Um, and I also provide a mirror, I think too. So they'll bounce an idea um, or if they're struggling with a training, like a set or a, a challenge, um, I think I kind of fill in the gap on the opposite and challenge them to think differently. So the, the, the mirror language really jumped out um, jumped out to me, um, which is, yeah, <laughs> interesting that you use that word. So, Stephanie, let me just read off the sheet that I have because I pulled some notes here, and I'm reading verbatim. Um, and, and what you need to understand here, I think, is, is a core idea, is that it, it's, it, it is a specific, again, this is a specific way that your brain reacts. You're able to, to connect with a diverse group of people. But let me read the sheet that I have because this is off of a slide deck that we use. 
uh, dual processors flow between sequential and associative processing. They relate to and follow the thinking patterns of a diverse group of people. They hold opposites. They shift easily back and forth between focused processing and diverse awareness. And sometimes what's interesting about it is people can't quite figure that out. They say, how do you do that? Um, they like it a lot. Uh, other times they say, you know, you, you came up with the right answer. Now, what we see in, in our work with people is that it, it, uh, it, it is a unique gift. And, and, once, and here's the thing. So what we talk about is we get to this notion of awareness. So now we start to work on awareness and, and this, uh, the definition of what we call metacognition or thinking about your thinking. Does that, does that resonate with you? Because it's interesting because a lot of dual processors in organizations, on teams, are kind of the go-to people because both sides, if it's a sequential or an associate, can find that common ground with the dual processor. Um, Aaron, do you remember, um, remind me, who was our, uh, uh, the former basketball, uh, Lexi, uh, who played basketball at Lehigh? Yes, Lexi at uh, Georgetown, yep. Okay, so, so she ended up uh, shifting to a different school, but Lexi uh, uh, was a, a former basketball player. She had been handpicked as the captain because, and this is what's interesting, Stephanie, her, her coach, and we, t we tested, tested the coach, and her coach ended up being a dual processor, and they felt like they had a, a great connection uh, as dual processors because they could shift back and forth between these two realities. And she was, she was handpicked as, as the uh, team captain. So, so it's a unique gift. Um, and it can't, what were you, you were about to say somebody, I think more when I said somebody about metacognition, I looked at your face, you changed it. No, no, you just get my attention whenever you say metacognition. So, uh, Stephanie, is this resonating with you? This sort of, as we're talking about this, it makes making sense for you? Yeah, definitely, it definitely does. Because cause I, I kind of think that we're, we're almost as though we can see um, both, both sides of the hook, really. You can see both, both um, thoughts from different people's perceptions. Like, so if you, somebody's having an argument, you can see it from both sides. So you know exactly what, where everyone's going and you know, what's, what's annoyed them or what's upset them or whatever. So I think, um, I think it's a good thing <laughs> to be like us because obviously um, we're, we're one of these settler people who can be in charge and, you know, relax everything, calm everything down. Right, and uh, provide perspective. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, take us into your, uh, I, I want to get into your, your competitive mindset a bit. Um, and that, your your you um, were a swimmer, um, and you competed at the highest levels. You so there's drive and resilience. Um, I know swimmers, and I know swimmers spend a lot of time in the pool. So there's that there's that drive first of all. Um, then there's resilience. When I looked over your sheet and what you've done, what you've overcome. Right, to have a debilitating disease like uh, MS and then come back and overcome that and not just overcome that, but overcome it in a way, like you're just, uh, you're glowing. I'm just, uh, I'm just looking at you like, just glowing over there. Thank you for that. It's such a <laughs> wonderful visual. Thank you. Um, what, you know, can you, we want to tap into uh, your perspective and your take, like, uh, the first question is like, how'd you do that? Like, how do you do that? How do you overcome and tap into that drive? And what is that drive as you see it or experience it? Yeah, uh, well, I was, I, I was a swimmer before. I was um, on my way to Sydney Olympics. I was the best in the country. I was very good. Um, but instead of going to Sid um, Sydney, I went blind three times and I was paralyzed and then diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 17. Um, I had the choice there. My mum said, do you want to sit back and get sicker and sicker? Or would you like to, you know, tell the world that you have MS, you know, that something's, something has attacked you? Would you like to fight back? And, and I just thought, yeah, I want to fight back. I'm not going to get sick. And so that's been my drive. I don't want to get sick. I want to keep on going. I've always had that will. I've always wanted that Olympic gold medal. And I didn't get it in Sydney because obviously I was too busy <laughs> getting, getting sick. But, um, but I still had that drive. I still wanted to get that Olympic gold medal. I came back, started training once I'd learned how to walk and move again. Um, and 
I kept on training and kept thinking gold medal, gold medal, gold medal. That was that was my drive. That's what I wanted. Um, and I kept on kept on training. I went to Beijing, came fourth, fifth, sixth. Went to London, got four silvers and a bronze. Fish, come on. And then went to Rio, got got two bronze, one silver, two gold. So I got that gold medal. I, I realized what you know. I've got what I wanted. My realized my dream. But the thing I uh, that's kept me going is you know. I've been given the MS for a reason. I think I've been given MS to, to inspire other people, to make people happier, to make other people realise that they don't need to get sick, um, you know, they don't need to give up just because they've got an illness. They can keep on fighting, what, you know, whatever illness it is, and keep on driving, keep on going for their goals. And I think I like to go to, well, everywhere now, to whatever charities I can and inspire people. Because, you know, if, you, if you've got a smile on your face, Everybody who sees that smile has to smile in return like you did earlier. So therefore, if you just walk around with a massive smile on your face, people will smile too. You'll make the world a happier place. So I think I was given MS to make the world a happier place. Wow. <laughs> not, I, I imagine that not everyone um, has that experience, <laughs> right? They're in the sense of seeing it as a gift. Um, and so... I, we're curious about where does that come from? Where does that, that takes courage. Uh, that takes um, a, a lot of what we call in coaching reframing, right? Here's this lousy thing and actually to turn it into a gift, uh, to see it as a gift and then use it as more fuel. And so we want to dig into like, this is what people are looking for right, is, is this ability to take something and, and make it better, make and share, right? This, this uh, ability to influence, to lead, to inspire. Where do you see that coming from? What's that? I, I want to know about the sort of the source of the drive. Where does that drive come from? That, the drive originally was that Olympic gold medal. I wanted that Olympic gold medal. And now it's just, I want to see the smiles. I want to help people. I want people to say thank you. And I want... Because there's so much, so much pain, so many, so many bad things happening in this world. And it just seems, seems bad. There must be something that we can do, that we can make it a better place. Because death is not a bad thing. Because, you know, apparently everybody dies with a smile on their face. So therefore, it must be a good thing. Hmm. So therefore, what are we fearing? You know, we might as well live each second as if it's our last and just smile the whole time. You know, achieve our goals, achieve our dreams become the person that you've always wanted to be. I never think of death as the end. It's just become a new opportunity, a new life. We don't know what death is. We, so therefore, you know, it could be this life and then another life and then another life. You know, we, we don't know. So every opportunity is incredible. Wow. The, wow. The, you know, Stephanie, I mean, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead, you need to cut you off. Go no, ahead. I was, I was going to say, um, Cam, you use the word reframing. Um, and I'm just listening to Stephanie talk and she's immediately reframing um, even the concept of drive or the concept of death. And I'm wondering how much of that comes from that balanced processor. So it is that holding the opposite of what, and what's uh, kind of commonly thought almost or plugging in the holes. And um, the concept of reframing just seems so natural. Um, to her is what it sounds like. So this idea that, you know, I'm getting sick, she says, but um, I wonder how much of it was really this, it is a conscious thought, but it seems like the only thought to her to, to flip it on into this positive and um, just look at her quest for a gold medal in a, in a different way. Um, so that reframing is naturally happening um, on a cognitive level and then it's coming out in, in behaviors as well. You know, that's a great point, Erin. And, and Sharon, I want you to, to chime in, if you will, because I know that you've talked to Stephanie a lot. You, you've interviewed her as well. And, and um, talking about this notion of resilience, how does that resonate with you? And, and I qualify because you are an associate processor and you, you, know, you, have, you have very, very strong core ideas and you find ways. But how does the notion of resilience um, uh, resonate with you, Sharon? Well, I think with, with Steph, I think, First thing is, Steph, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I just want to take you back to Rio 2016 when you came out, if I've got it right, I think it was in the 400 freestyle women's race. Because um, for our listeners who are not listening, you actually came out in a wheelchair, didn't you? Um, <laughs> in an electric wheelchair and just completely different to how you are now. And I think 
going back to your question, Perry, I think Steph has really managed to strengthen her resilience and really look at kind of, I would say, retraining your brain. I don't know. I just, I just look at everything that she's done and, and achieved. And she just doesn't take no for an answer. And I just keep going back to that quote, what she was just saying to Cam is, I wanted that gold medal. That's it. I want it. I'm having it. And I think that that kind of sums up Steph. And yeah, it, she's just totally amazing with what she's done. But the question I would ask Steph is, how do you manage um, to strengthen your resilience? So how have you how have you done that mentally? Well, basically, I come out in a wheelchair after every single race. I normally have to have two people drag me out of the swimming pool as well to get me into the wheelchair. Normally I have spasms in my arms and my legs, but that is just a side effect of MS and it's, it's a side effect of me wanting to do the best I possibly can in that race. So therefore it's, it might be a bad side effect, but it's, it's, you know, it's something that I've brought on myself because I want to win another gold or I want to swim another race or I want to do something to inspire other people. So, so the fact that I come back, I come out in that wheelchair is just, it's just something that happens. <laughs> it's, it's neither a bad nor a, nor a good thing. It's just what happens. No, but I, I, I don't think many people would say, I, I, I just I just get me into a wheelchair, I just you know, have the help. So, you know, going back to what Erin says, you, you do flip everything on its head. You really do. And I've seen you hold a room when you've been speaking and, and the people that you meet, you, you're just an inspiration to people because you show that you've got that drive to recover. And, and to go on and not just mean one gold medal, but a few of them. So I think that in itself, is, as I've said, you shine hope and light into so many other people's lives who have got MS. And I think people forget that sometimes. Thank you very much. Just today, there was this one man who's, who's got MS and he's, um, he's been losing his sight for a while, but he's just completely lost it now. And he said, I've got nothing. I've got nowhere to go. I've got absolutely nothing I can do. I said, you can be a radio presenter, you could be a TV presenter for children, you could do anything. And so I've asked the local radio to put him to interview him on, on a radio. So he's going to be live soon. And it's, it's put that smile back onto his face, even though he can't do anything, even though he can't see, he can't move, he can't do anything. But I've just put that little smile back on his face. Make the world shine too. <laughs> there's, there's a, so I'm, you know, you talk about getting, being fulfilled with, with uh, creating smiles. Your, your smile is completely infectious. I'm just like, you know, your smile is going to like fuel me for the rest of the day here, Stephanie. Thank you. There, there's something else going on here because, you know, the CPP is a lens in which we look through things, but your conversation about um, specifically fear, you use the word fear. And really, is it, it's, fear is almost like the wheelchair. It's just this thing. It's there. And it just got to deal with it, right? It's like, okay, it's there. And um, it reminded, again, you're reminding me of uh, Kiko Matthews, um, who was on the show a, a few weeks ago, who is right now currently rowing across uh, the Atlantic to try to break the, the women's record of uh, 55 days or so. And she had a very similar approach to worry as you do with fear. It's like, uh, you know what? It really doesn't do me any good. It's just this thing. And the positive or the opportunities really outweigh going to this negative place. And so for Kiko, it was like, you know, I could be out there worried, but it's not going to get me uh, one mile rowing. It's not going to make me row faster or slower. And it's just, in a sense, uh, it's a waste of time, right? This swimming is about ultimate efficiency. You kind of be, we don't want to be like a tuna in there, right? I mean, uh, the tunas are built for speed and the water is laminar flow over the, the, right? You're trying to get the most out and be as efficient as possible. And any kind of negative thought is really a, a turbulence or inefficiency for you. And what I'm noticing is, in addition to, and Kiko is a high, high associative, right? And you're a dual processor. Very high associative. <laughs> yeah, very high associative. Yeah. But what you have is a positivity, right? This positive outlook on life that, um, and, and so that's the thing that, that as you bring in is, uh, is a real driver for you, isn't it? 
I mean, uh, if I'm doing, say, a 100 meter dirt straight, which is my favorite event, I generally can't see the, um, there's a, a flag that goes across at five meters that tells you where, where to turn. I generally can't see that flag very well, so I have to do my straight counts. And often when I do the tumble turn, I can't see anything. I go as good as blind. So it's very, very dizzying, very, um, it's not very, <laughs> not a very nice feeling, but, but I know it's going to come, so I'm ready for it. And so when I push off underwater, generally my legs don't work very well, and I still can't see very well, but I know it's, I know it's going to happen. So therefore, even though it's a scary thing and you can't see anything, you can't be worried about it. You know that you've got to, you've got to do it as fast as possible to be back swimming again. Every turn is, you know, a bit of a nightmare, but you have to think of it as just a, a means of turning over and getting back on the other side. If that makes sense. So every fear, every burden is, is like she was saying, a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. So think of it as, you know, you know, every hurdle is, 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 you know, in the way, but you've got to find a way through it, under it, over it, around it, whatever way you can. If there is a hurdle, I always think of myself as water, because water can sneak just about through anything. So if, if there's a hurdle in your way, how would water get through it? <laughs> Cam, let me, let me, Stephanie, can I respond to that? Because what's interesting, I think, um, and Aaron, you know, shoot me down or back me up on this, is that as a dual processor, you know, we're, a part of it is, is that we never really stop working between, you know, the why and the how. And sometimes we may linger on the how a little bit longer and then we go back to the why. But we always feel in a way we can find the solution. We just have to kind of work our way through it. We may get stuck a little bit, but we're going to find that balance between those two and we'll end up finding the solution. And that, you know, that, that is kind of the root to um, a lot of things. Success, creativity, resilience. Um, but in, in, to a certain extent, um, it's being okay uh, with not being satisfied and turning that into a positive. Um, because, because at times it can be a little bit difficult to say, look, I, I am in balance. I found that balance because we're, we're inherently um, uh, uh, motivated or, or, or wired, I would say, again, wired, just wired to lead, wired to try and uh, find the next thing that's going to work for us. Having said that, the question that I had for you, and, and we talked a little bit earlier in an earlier uh, discussion, uh, the people around you, the support networks, the people that say, you know, either either in UK swimming and, and the, uh, the you know the, the Paralympic uh, committee and and the you know, everything that, that goes along with that, you know, the pool, um, finding support in those people. How how do you approach that? Are you finding the support that you need to 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 accomplish your mission? And how do you, you're laughing now, I'll stop. <laughs> um, well, I, I won two gold medals in Rio, along with, you know, four, three other medals. And uh, my funding, uh, which was, was originally offered by British Swimming, it was um, taken away from me because of my age. I'm apparently too old to, to be an Olympic swimmer anymore, even though I won two gold medals. I know, so um, the, fun, the support from uh, the country is not very good <laughs> at all. But um, uh, a local business has helped me out. It's offered me some, some, some support. So I just thought it was funny because, like, my country's not really offering me that much support. But all the people, all the, all the other people, anyone you walk to, anyone you speak to in the rest of the world is fantastic. It's, it's really kind, really supportive. Yeah, it's just the people in charge. <laughs> but, but your core group of people that support you, you know, your, your family, your husband, I mean, they, they, those are the ones that you lean on. And, and obviously, you know, they, they've gravitated toward you and they've supported you through the years. Because the thing I would also comment on is that your career has been extensive. I mean, you, you, know, you, start, you know, here it is, and we look back at your bio, and, you know, at age 17, you, know, you grew up in Saudi Arabia, and you're still swimming. And you're, you're also preparing for Tokyo, correct? I mean, you've got Tokyo coming up. So, well, I, I was born in Saudi and I, I loved it there, but it was so hot. So that was my reason for learning to swim. And uh, since, since learning to swim, I've just been swimming forever. I love it. I love teaching other people. I love swimming with people. Um, the good thing about swimming is uh, when, when, I'm walk, when I'm walking in there, I struggle. I have to watch where I walk because of the MS. But when I'm in the pool, there's nothing to get in my way. You know, the, the water holds me up so I don't have to think about falling. Um, the only thing would be the you know the ends the turns, but <laughs> but other than the turns, the pool is there. It's, it's you know a free world for me. It's amazing. Well, I, I think. Uh, uh, go ahead, Kim. Sorry, go ahead. Well, just that that um, we're finding that there's no there's no preferred preference in the and it and and it's really um, with the with the uh, cognitive peak profile, 
And it's really a matter of um, being aware of your strengths, uh, being aware of, being aware of, of uh, how you operate in the world, you know, and that I think that there's so many people who are kind of looking for the right environment to thrive. And just for you, this, it's almost like a metaphor that the pool is your place of thriving, right? It, it provides the support where you can just be a champion. And you know this, right? You know that um, transition, uh, flipping at the end of the pool is a challenge. And yet it's just a wonderful um, perspective on transition, right? Like, okay, there's really good stuff in between, right? And I just got to get through this. And it's, um, it's, it's, again, really great awareness on your part that you're putting into action. Um, if there's uh, Carol Dweck writes a book called Mindset and talking about growth mindset and fixed mindset. And as you're talking about moving through that, the, the turn at the end and getting through transitions, right, that transition to get back at what you thrive at, if people can get stuck. They can get stuck in a way of thinking, right? Of like, uh, oh, I have a terrible disease and uh, I have no, there's no opportunity, right? I've given my, I've, my, I've been given a death sentence and bummer. And then they're there stuck in that way of thinking and can't transition out. Or, or they're in a, uh, a work situation where they think they're, they have no control of the situation. And then you get this victim kind of sense of, you know, I'm stuck in this place and there's really nothing I can do. And so it just is so refreshing to hear you be so clear about what works for you. And it's a really simple formula, it seems, or at least it's simple to you. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I just think, you know, mathematics, one plus one is two. So therefore, if you have two and you take away one, you've got one. So it's, it's easy. So therefore, you can do anything if you just believe you can. You know, it's, it's logical. It's easy. <laughs> that, made me, uh, that sounds great on Friday. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to you, but again, it's, it's seeing that thing that is so obvious to you that might not be obvious to others, right? So and the thing that just stuck out to me, one of the things you said, um, growing up in, in Saudi Arabia, it was hot. So I found something that was cool, being in the water. Like there, it's, it's filling in this, this opposite <laughs> gap, right? Like, um, and I, I, that, what, that phrase really stuck out to me because it's this means to an end, you know? Um, but it, and, and Perry, going back to what you said, uh, kind of that constant toggling between the how um, and the why. And I always think of it, it has this, this um, coupled with Stephanie's positive, it's like this positive momentum. It's this, um, boulder rolling down the hill, right? Like we're just going forward. We'll figure out a way. We'll, um, there's always a solution to the problem. Um, you know, funny that you're using a math equation, but there's always a solution, um, or another way to work around it. And, and kind of living in that, um, forward minded ambiguity is something that I keep on thinking about. Uh, even the, talking about the, the flip turn, well, you call it a, a tumble turn, but the, the flip turn here in America, um, knowing that, you know what's going to happen is that you're not going to have any control. So the dichotomy of saying, when I'm flipping, I can't see, I kind of lose my sense of balance, but, I, but you said, I know what's going to happen, even though in that moment you have no control. So it's, it's holding both of those things and at the same time and having them be very real to you and using it, as, as uh, Cam said, this transition phase to get to your ultimate goal of a new best time or a gold medal or whatever it might be. Um, so again, I'm just seeing both of these like back and forth toggling thing, uh, theme kind of coming up over and over again. And, and again, Stephanie, we're, you know, this is a teaching moment here. We're going to remind you that, that this is a rather rare um, way of processing information, uh, uh, you know, especially I mentioned before in the, in, in the, uh, the groups that were assembled to put together this particular in instrument, the, um, the dual processors came up as, as, you know, right around that 4%. Uh, so you are unique. I mean, I, I just by, you know, in, in our assessment, you're very unique. Um, I tell you one thing I do want to shift over to, I want to get over to um, the, the, the other areas of the, of the assessment in the interest of time. Um, and those are what we call the, the immortal domains. That's the mover, the observer, the reader, 
talker and listener and stuff here that's okay with you, I'll, I'll, I'll just quote your scoring in these particular categories. Um, in, in mover, you're selective. Uh, in observer, you're selective. Reader, you're selective. And actually, we're, the reader, uh, uh, interesting in that category, we're seeing a lot more selective readers. So I think people are just taking in information differently. You're, you're active in your talker uh, and you are active in your listener. So I'm going to jump on the listener right now. And we had talked about your perception of how you hear things and how you compete based on that particular preference. And, and can you tell everybody how you break down how you listen? And, and you, you went through the process so beautifully. Um, but in terms of your starts, how does that resonate with you um, as, as, uh, as you're getting ready to compete? Basically, you sort of have to start off when uh, we're all behind in the call-up room and then you get called up, you get, you get taken out onto, onto the starting box and I actually have to have help get onto the starting box because I think I can't. Um, so I just think that is, that is a support. Somebody else is offering me support and I get onto that starting block, get ready to go. Um, and then the caller will say, uh, swimmers, take your marks and you're, you're there, you're ready and then go. And on that take your marks, you're all tense, you're all ready, you're all, you know, you're, you're waiting for it. But my brain just does it automatically. I, I don't even think about it anymore. It just goes and it listens to the, the bell, the gun, the whistle, whatever it may be. And it's take your marks, go. And then into the water, streamline position. Um, yeah, get ready to go into action. It's, it's kind of a movement I do often and you know, it's good. It's, yeah, it makes me smile. <laughs> Well, people have reported that, that, you know, especially active listeners and, and Sharon, Sharon, I think your profile came up as an active listener, correct? I think so. I haven't got it in front of me at the moment, yeah. but I, I definitely know it was I in um, Observer. Um, so, and yeah. I think listener as well. So, well, yeah. It's interesting, Stephanie, because the whole thing about this is that, you know, when people report this, you know, sometimes there's an active listener and Aaron, I know you're an active listener as well. We pick up a lot of noise kind of peripheral noise as well but but a lot of people report when they are focused um and, and it's almost as if you know if you think about it like a, ba a bandwidth issue or a radar um you know when you're focused on that one thing and of course you have the intention behind it when you're when you're getting ready to get off those blocks or get off the edge of the pool Aaron, i'm riffing here i want you to explain what 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 is the, the what is that thing the, the starting tower uh with you have you have the, the light you have the sound what, what what is that the the starting tower uh like when you would be starting the the actual yeah, race, the race. So, yeah. yeah so there's the um official which um we were kind of mentioning and they say swimmers take like step up usually to the block or um, however it would be and then swimmers take your mark um, and then they there's usually a flash of light and the sound um, so it's a combination of both of those things and then um, and then you go. So, but, but a lot, a lot of that obviously is for the timers, but as well for the swimmers. I mean, so the swimmers have to know the cadence, and they have to they 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 home in on that. And so, what I'm saying here, I'm trying to get to the point, is that you know, for you, Stephanie, it seems like you know, since your brain activates so readily um, for that particular preference, you know that your point of focus will will orient around that preference as you are going into the pool, as you are prepping yourself, and and you're and you're locked into that. And, and because you're so active, I mean, I, I don't know how other athletes might might look at that or how they would perceive that as far as their start. But I, I would definitely say that, you know, that it, it has to be an asset for you that, uh, that that benefits you enormously because it's very active. It came up as a 62.5. And on, on that, can I can I ask a question about yeah. the listening? Is, is that okay? Um, Steph, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, I think sometimes we struggle with getting tough feedback and then I think to get in a position where you've been at now, um, I can imagine that some of the feedback you've had has been quite challenging. And, and sometimes I think tough feedback can strike tension with coaches and, and with people that they're working with. And I think, how do you utilize it? How, how, have you, how, how do you take tough feedback on? Because some of the other athletes I've worked with, some of them will listen and, and some don't. So how, how have you listened and taken that tough feedback on and used it as an advantage? Um, I always think of, I always think that there's only one competitor in the race. I know there's another what, eight lanes, nine lanes being used up, but there's only one competitor in the race and it's you. 
the only person you can change is yourself. You cannot change what anybody else is doing or what anybody else is swimming, what, what anybody else is, you know, how they're feeling. They might get a world record. Who knows? It doesn't matter because you can't change that. The only thing you can change is what you are doing and how you are thinking. Um, so therefore, you need to go and try and get the personal best of yourself and just think there is nobody else in that pool. It's just you and the pool. Uh, and don't think about anybody else. Uh, if, if, the, um, if the coach gives you a positive comment, or to take it as a good thing, something has worked correctly for you. And if they give you a negative thing, then they are trying to make you that bit better so that the next swim will be a positive. So that the next time you try to attempt to dive or, or whatever it is that they've commented on, that, neg that, that, whatever, that skill will be that much better. So therefore, a negative comment is a positive. Two negatives equal a positive. So therefore, if they give you a negative comment, it's going to be positive eventually. It's always See, going to be you're, you, and you even smile when you use the word negative, don't you? There you go, you just sunshine. <laughs> Thank you. I've got, a, I've got a, an area that I'd like to look at is the, with the active talker and listener. And so um, I'm an active talker and listener too. Uh, and that uh, as a coach, what, what, what active talkers and listeners often have is sort of uh, they find meaning in conversation. Right, and they will typically have meaningful conversation, right? That there's there's an engagement there, and I can hear your high talker, right? That I can see as you're talking, and the whole idea of the immortal is that this is these are areas where we build build knowledge, right? Make meaning, and so um, based in Howard Gardner's work of multiple intelligences, we you know, the, the verbal processor will. As they are speaking, they are making sense of their world. Um, but I'm sort of thinking about the smiles, right? The conversations you have with people, and I'm just kind of curious about that. And and does do you have that experience of meaningful conversation with people and noticing that you're a pretty good listener, right? Does it do, do these scores resonate with you? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I go to lots and lots of places to try and just to let people talk, let people, you know, to get the bad things off of their chest, to let people, you know, just release whatever tension it is that's been blocking them. Uh, because I always think of negative energy or, or bad thoughts as a block, as, you know, some, some little resistance in your way. So therefore, if somebody releases it, if somebody lets it go and just talks to somebody for a little while, it's always enough to, you know, to set them off, let them to do whatever they want to do, free them. So I think I'm definitely a listener. I definitely um, allow people to speak and to let whatever nasty comment or nasty thought in their mind, let them you know, release it. Um, and I love it because I gain strength from people trusting me to, to with their problems or with their, their issues. And I'm, um, I'm going to jump in real quick, if that's okay. I, that made me think maybe from the coaching side, but um, so knowing that that's where you're gaining strength and, and this high talker being able to process through, what's kind of your method um, in the middle of a, a long training week or a long particular set? How, how do you kind of inside your head, because with swimming, you, you know, your face is in the water. You're not talking to somebody um, in the middle of a set. So do you have a, a narrative in your head or that you're kind of using or is it visuals or do you just kind of dissociate or what's kind of your method for pushing through um, physically in some of the, in some of those harder training moments? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of use my steps. I always think of every step is a positive thing. So every, every time I take one step or one movement forwards, every time I go anywhere forwards is a positive. Therefore, every straight that I swam is positive. Every, you know, if, if we've got a set of, say, 2100s max or whatever, then one, one um, first one of the 20 would be good because it would be a starting point. And then you'd have to keep on going, keep on fighting, keep on rising. And you think, yeah, I've done three now, so therefore I've got 17. So therefore I can shine again. I can keep on going. Let's try and make this better. How can I get it better? Um, can I enter the water easier? Can I, can I work the technique? Can I get this much better? <laughs> technique, you think about turns, you think about um, stroke te te technique, you think about stroke count, you think about everything. And you just think about, yeah, how can I make this better? How can I, I make this session that much easier for me? Because obviously, the less strokes you do in a length, 
the more energy you'll have. So therefore, can I knock one stroke off on one 100 to make me so much better than the next one? So yeah, always think about how can that 100 be better? That's how I think it. <laughs> Is that, um, that's is, really interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Well, Aaron, I, and I just sort of want to check in with the dual processors here, Aaron and Perry. Is that sort of the dual processor experience? Is the sort of um, uh, how do I make this better? Right, this to, the toggling piece. I'm kind of curious. Well, I there. think I think for me, um, that what she just said really resonated because every lap, every stroke, every, I remember being in, in sets, you know, when I was swimming or even in running, um, being in a rep on the track. And it was this, even in what she just said, she would go big picture, which is um, how is this going to lead to my ultimate goal? Um, how do I bring in like overall efficiency? Um, and then bringing it back in a small lens to each individual stroke, each little piece of technique, um, and kind of back or big picture. I'm on number 17, and now I'm on number 14, and now I'm on number 12. And I think that also plays into the uh, that high talker and the high listener. So it's it's giving your brain something to think about. Um, I've had swimmers as a coach that like just cannot attach to that idea at all. And so I have to train them to think about every stroke or a way to move through a set. Um, whereas for me, it was so natural. I had to pick something to, to kind of just ruminate on the entire time I was training. Um, so whether it was a stroke or a count or a technique or the flip turn or what the next segment of the, the set was going to be. Um, and so I, I kind of heard that come through and I was wondering if her experience would be the same. And I wonder if that is a, um, a function of the dual processing, finding something um, for your brain to be, to be constantly thinking about. Well, right. Okay. The, the, and uh, Perry, let me jump in real quick. Just the, the dual processor with the, with the high talker listener in the sense that there's a narrative there, Stephanie. You're, you're, having, a, you're having a dialogue with yourself, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, again, it's, uh, so that, that's getting my attention. Perry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, just a couple of comments here because, you know, here it is. And, and you know, Aaron, you know, from, from the athletic side, you understand that, you know, we all interpret how we compete differently. Um, for me, um, and Stephanie, I, I played football in college, uh, gridiron, I guess, for, for you guys. Um, and I, I had to, to plant the notion in my mind um, a couple things. I had to give myself this idea. Number one, everybody was going to be better than I was. So, so how do I counter that? So, so this is my dual processor going off. I had to get a little angry. I had to figure out a way to get just a little angry uh, during the game to, to ground myself. And then what was interesting about it is that you go through the process of playing the game, playing your position, and then finishing it. And then that's when the analysis would set in. And so sometimes the analysis could be rigorous. Sometimes it could, for me, it could shift over a little bit in the negative and say, you know, I'm, I'm obsessing about the things that didn't quite work out. But what's interesting from the dual processing side is that once I slept on it, I, I had my answer. The next day, I was fine. I said, well, wow, there's clarity here. That seems to be, and I hear this over and over again when we talk to dual processors, is, is they wake up the next day and they say, wow, I got the answer. I, I figured it out. And, and it's almost as if a, a weight has kind of been, been taken off of you because, you know, as your, as your brain is resting, um, that you have clarity. And so sometimes we do have to, it, we have the intensity of competition, but uh, the, the time to wind down uh, within the both sides that are going back and forth saying, you know, you did this, you, you know, did I do it correctly or did I have the right idea behind that? You find those answers over time. Um, and so, so for me, it was always better uh, to, to come to a resolution the next day. Um, and, then, and then say, hey, I'm going to go do it again, and I'm going to do it even better. So always, always very motivated that way. Um, you know, I, you guys, I, I, we can talk for a long time. I mean, uh, Stephanie, I'd love to have you on again. Would you, would you promise to come on and let's do another broadcast? Yeah, definitely. But I, it, it, so in the spirit of competition, and you are very positive, so you've got, you have Tokyo coming up. So who, who uh, give me a couple of names here who, um, who you're going to be, looking out for in Tokyo that you, uh, that you've competed with. And I'll give you one name here, Natalie De De uh, Toy. Is that her name? Um, yeah, she's very good, but she's retired now. So. Oh, she is. Okay. Well, that's too bad. I was wondering, did, did we like her? I mean, was she, uh, she, she seemed like a pretty good competitor. Um, yeah. Com very, very good competitor, but a lovely person as well. Which good. Is really, which is even better. So yeah, she was always my friend as well as kind of my enemy, I suppose. But yeah, she was, yeah, she was a lovely person. 
um, but the thing is, she was so fast and she was such a big person, like very, very uh, large, uh, very tall, very large, very strong. Um, but you just had to think, I've got to be as fast as her, if not faster. So therefore, she was a target. She was somewhat of one to choose. Yeah, she was a very inspiring person. Okay, well, I'm glad she's a nice person. I'm trying to stir you up a little bit and see. Uh, if she were competing, I'd say, well, you know, what are we going to do about that? You know, but, uh, but yeah, she said she's retired, so. Well, listen, Cam, Sharon, Yay. final Yay. words. Um, I, I, think, I, I think this has been a great session. Aaron, we appreciate your hanging in there. I know you, you had a time, uh, time constraint. Um, any final words? And, and then I, I want to, uh, to give a great send off here to Stephanie and, and appreciate your, very much your time and, and uh, you know, coming over to America on our side and giving us your perspective. And, and we're gonna press, I will tell you, we're gonna press hard for, uh, for trying to understand a little bit why uh, the UK Swimming Federation isn't really you know, behind the effort. Um, so we're gonna start <laughs> getting our voice to that. But uh, let's go around the horn. Um, Sharon, let's start with you. Um, tell, me, uh, tell me some final thoughts here. Oh, well, f final thoughts is, I think, first of all, looking at my, well, not my um, assessment in front of me, but going back to your step and the listener is, I think, Obviously, you know, we're in the UK and I think both of us, you know, looking at our CPPs, um, we're both eye listeners, but I think our lives would have been different if we would have listened to everybody that told us not to go ahead and not to fight. And the message, I think I, my takeaway message from you today is decide how to fight, you know, and strive forward. And, um, and I think your joy comes from a sense of connection within the pool and your place of pool is just happens to be where you win gold medals so that is just I think you, you definitely give us a, a sense of a sense of connection and a sense of joy and get others to decide how to fight so thank you thank you Perry thanks guys absolutely thank you how about you Aaron that was that was very nice Sharon thank you I think to kind of Sharon's point I just really appreciate the messaging of um, kind of when faced with a challenge don't change your goal uh, just change your approach kind of you knew you wanted a gold medal and you were going to figure out a way to get it no matter what life uh, kind of threw at you um, or, or anything or no matter what anybody threw at you for that matter and I just really appreciate being able to be on and, and doing it in such a positive way I, I love kind of the imaging of um, kind of the dual imaging of this fighter but with a smile on your face and I think that that's such a strong empowering um, visual that I've created in my mind for you and um, and just for your for what you stand for and I, I really appreciate that and um, I just really appreciate being a car part of this conversation as well um, you know I definitely respect and um, am in awe of a lot of your accomplishments and um, it's just great to get to spend time with such a, a high-level person and a high-level athlete so thank you that's great. Thank you, Aaron. That's, uh, that, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying. And, and you know, it's, it's very interesting to be able to, uh, to have these perspectives and, and have people who are actually willing to kind of break down their, their, uh, their processing and, and, uh, and learn as we go along. How about you, Cam? So what, uh, um, in doing these Wired to Lead podcasts and speaking to uh, leaders and disruptive innovators and fresh thinkers and visionaries, I'm learning a lot about leadership. Um, I'm learning a lot about uh, winning and competing and fighting and perspective um, and the mindset that goes with that. And to piggyback on what Aaron and Sharon was just saying, that, uh, your form of leadership, Stephanie, is to you, you, you're finding the spaces where you can thrive, right? Is to recognize the space, uh, whether it's in a dialogue with uh, to make a difference with someone or it's in the pool. I think that that's a key part of leadership is recognizing where's the environment that you thrive and stay there uh, as much as possible and move through those transitions to get back to that space. So and I really appreciate you uh, being on the show today. We'd also like to get your final thoughts. So what are your final thoughts, Stephanie? Well well, I've loved this conversation because it's been so interesting and like all of the all of the results that you found are so me they're so incredible it's amazing I just I love the way that you you've asked me questions which have almost promoted me to open up loads and to tell you my opinions and 
I've loved listening to other people's reactions to, to whatever I've said and to, to the smile on my face, the smile, you know. What's up you got? Many, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Where, where I was just about to say, all those many years ago, 20 years ago when I first got MS and I was always crying. I was always thinking of it as a bad thing, but now I think of it as such a good thing, you know look at what life has given me now it's amazing my life is perfect and all i can do now is to just give hope give give life give spirit give you know give give that dream give people the ability to do whatever they want to do and yeah my life is incredible it doesn't matter if ms might take it away eventually it doesn't matter because i will have done everything i wanted to do in the process i will have made people smile i will have made people you know, become the person they wanted to be it's, it's amazing thank you so much for this conversation Oh, we're so happy you could join Thank us. Thank you. Yeah, it's just absolutely yeah. positive and wonderful. Um, Stephanie, I am going to ask you, where can people get a hold of you? So you, you t tell us tell us your website. Tell us, you know, let's, let's get some good plugs in here. How can, how can we amplify your message here? Because it's, such, it's so positive and we want the audience to be able to connect with you. Well, I haven't really got a website at the moment, but a Facebook, I think, which is, I'm sorry to say, Facebook is the biggest place you can link to me. Or on um, Twitter or something. And LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. Yeah. And your books are in the shops and everywhere else. Yes. <laughs> hopefully, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, well, we're going to make sure to send out information on that and make sure that people know how to, how to get a hold of you and, and, uh, and learn a little bit more about you. But uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to thank everybody, all the guests, Cam, my, uh, my partner in crime here. Uh, Sharon, thanks for joining us as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, and anyone who wants to take the assessment, here's, here's our plug, www.avalonleadership.com. You may find out, find out some things that you didn't know about yourself and uh, find out uh, some blind spots or also find out those superpowers that, uh, that you kind of always knew you had, but um, now we can actually find those for you. But please check us out. Uh, join us in the Avalon Leadership effort. Uh, the website is www.avalonleadership.com. Uh, and we will be joining you again very soon with another edition of the Wired to Lead podcast. And once again, thank you. Have a great day. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are Wired to Lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com, where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.